guys. So, uh, good morning, and welcome to PAX East 2014. So, um, as, as many of you may know, uh, Harmonics is actually based right here in the Boston area, uh, across the river in Cambridge, actually. That's right. <laughs> And uh, those of you in the audience uh, who actually live in the New England area know that we have just endured a particularly long, cold, icy ass kicker of a winter. Um, so, you know, having now finally made it out uh, the other side of that uh, ordeal, you know, coming back from life beyond the wall, as it were, um, <laughs> you know, here we are in the cusp of spring uh, and the, the thaw. And, uh, you know, I just have to say that um, the opportunity to be here at PAX East uh, and witness the spectacle of tens of thousands of excited, passionate game fans converging uh, here to celebrate games and each other uh, really warms the spirits after a cold winter. And uh, again, just for me and the, the whole crew at Harmonix actually, welcome to Boston. <laughs> So um, a little bit later uh, in this hour, I, I want to spend, you know, I'll spend some time talking briefly about a few of the projects that Harmonix uh, currently has in the works and why and how we're generally thinking about the challenges of independent game development right now and what that means for our future and that kind of stuff. Uh, but before I get to all that, um, I first uh, would like to spend some time telling um, the story of our first, our last 19 years um, as a prologue for much of what we're up to today. Um, but before I even get to that, uh, I should probably say right up front that if you're a rock band fan who's here hoping for a Rock Band 4 announcement or a Dance Central fan who's here hoping for a Dance Central 4 announcement, I'm sorry to disappoint you uh, on both counts, um, except to say, uh, of course, that, you know, both of these franchises are near and dear to our hearts at Harmonix, and we have grand plans to bring back both of them with guns blazing uh, at some point in the coming console cycle, so uh, I'm afraid that's all I can say about that this morning, but please stay tuned. Okay, so now that I've got that out of the way, uh, let's actually get started. So, uh, just <laughs> pre harmonics just a little bit uh, about my own background. Uh, I actually grew up not too far from here, up on the North Shore, and my own history with video games started when I was three years old uh, in 1972, and my father brought home a shiny new Magnavox Odyssey console. Um, and, you know, the games you could play on these machines at the dawn of consoles were, like, ridiculously primitive. Um, but even at that point, they were magical in their own way, and uh, me and my little brothers were, like, even as tots, instantly captivated. Um, and then so our early obsession with Odyssey gave way to Atari, of course, and then Intellivision and ColecoVision and on and on. And then, you know, eventually when the Apple II showed up, I kind of took a detour for a long time into PC games, particularly at first Zork and like all of the great Infocom text adventures and like a lot of the great classics of the early PC and uh, computer game era. Um, so at the same time, while I was growing up, uh, I was always playing around with music. Uh, like trying to learn to play various instruments at one time or another and never getting good at any of them. Um, I was always just a hack. Um, but alongside games, um, music was always like the central fixation uh, of my inner life as a kid. Um, just because of this incredible power it has, along, you know, like games, to just you know, transport me in my imagination to very different places. And so I eventually ended up in college across the river at MIT, uh, where I majored in music composition of all things. Um, there are not so many music majors at MIT, but it turns out it's a really fun place to study music. Uh, and then I found my way to grad school in, a, you know, in the computer music group at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, and it was there that I met Iran Agosi, uh, who was a, a, a brilliant computer scientist, but also a really serious musician, way more than I was, actually. Uh, but we became fast friends, and right after we graduated, we decided to start harmonics together, and that was back in 1995. This was us around that time. Yes. <laughs> T uh, time has not been kind. Um, so, the uh, funny thing is, like, despite the, my having been completely steeped in games uh, when I was growing up, when Iran and I first started Harmonix, actually, video games were the furthest thing from our minds at that point. Um, like, we, 
we were actually just preoccupied with solving what we believed was a problem in the world that needed solving, um, which is this. So put very simply, making music feels incredibly good. Uh, it's more than that, really. It's like one of the most genuinely blissful and transcendent experiences that life has to offer. Um, and almost all of us feel the urge at some point in our lives to learn to do this, and we try, and almost all of us quickly learn that it's punishingly difficult, and we give it up in frustration, um, and so we throw in the towel, and you know, we resign ourselves to a life of air guitar. <laughs> so Ron and I really wanted to solve this problem, and so we started uh, this company with the mission of basically inventing new, new ways to give non-musicians access to this very special pleasure that comes from making music. Um, so, uh, for the remainder of this history lesson, I want to uh, illustrate our history to, to date with the help of this uh, uh, very unscientific graph, um, which, on which the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is like roughly sales, I guess, but I prefer to think of it as like um, how much the world seemed to give a shit about what we were up to. <laughs> um, so here we are at inception in spring of 1995. So our very first product was a PC CD-ROM title called The Axe. There's this menu screenshot of that. Um, the idea was really simple. A player could use an ordinary PC mouse or preferably a joystick to like, freely improvise instrumental solos in real time over a chosen background song. And uh, you know, the player would be creatively shaping the solo, kind of controlling the rise and fall of the melody or the, the rhythmic intensity uh, and, of the, and phrasing and whatnot. But all the hard stuff, like knowledge of harmony and scales and rhythmic execution and all that, that was kind of hidden under the hood in the, in, in the software. And this feeling of a novice being able to step up and just freely improvise, it was kind of magical and new, and so it made like a really good demo. And we got kind of deceived by that, but players always seemed really impressed and delighted when they played with it, and we were naively quite proud of ourselves and sure that we were like onto something big here. Um, but like, here's the thing, like, n no matter how much fun people had with it initially for the first you know, 15 or 20 minutes, uh, there was no kind of incentive structure to keep them going, and the novelty wore off you know, quickly, and it just wasn't sticky. And um, long story short, in the end, uh, we sold substantially fewer copies of the Axe than there are people sitting in this room right now. So here's, here we are, we've released the Axe at this point. Um, but undaunted, like we spent years trying to find other ways to commercialize this, like in theme parks and in karaoke bars and you name it. Like we were so convinced that we were on the right track that it blinded us. And it made us really s stubborn, I think, and uh, slow to accept the fact that the market just didn't want what we had made, at least not in its, you know, in that form. But by the, you know, by the late 90s, we were like. Uh, you know, we, we had no choice but to come to grips with the fact that we had spent years at this point, years, chasing a red herring. Um, and this cumulative failure uh, was our first great humbling as, uh, as a company, and although far from the last, as you'll soon see. Um, we still felt just as strongly about what we were trying to accomplish in the world, but like we had to confront the fact that like all of our uh, original ideas about how to go that that go about that had run their course. And like things were really looking quite grim for us at this point. Like we didn't know where to go next. But then something amazing happened, which is this new category of games, rhythm action games, sprung up in Japan in the late 90s. And they were thriving there. And you know, these, these early music games were really simple, but they were really fun. And we loved them. And they kind of changed everything for us at that moment because like at that moment we just realized like duh you know games th games are the medium through which we can connect people to music in new ways so th this became our new focus at that point and but we knew nothing about how to make games at that point so we started going about the process of recruiting game development talent from the boston area mostly looking glass studios which was a you know well-known developer in boston at the time and slowly we cobbled together a team and started prototyping our very first game idea, uh, which was this kind of uh, hypnotic, electronica-themed, multi-track uh, rhythm action game. Um, and by early 2000, we had our first kind of crude prototype of this thing running. So we promptly set about hunting for a publisher who, who could you know, fund and, and market and distribute the rest of this game. So we had no track record at all, and most publishers like, wouldn't give us a time of day. 
Um, there were some of them who would, and those that did basically took one look at this like weird prototype that we had made, and they politely showed us the door. And there was exactly one exception, and that was Sony, Sony Computer Entertainment. And we didn't, it's funny, we didn't know anyone uh, at Sony at the time, so we didn't really even know how to get started there. So we literally called the front switchboard at Sony and said, uh, can we talk to someone in product development there? And I don't know how this happened, but the switchboard operator forwarded us directly to the desk line of the head of studios at Sony in North America, Shu Yoshida, <laughs> who like took the call and, like, and graciously agreed to meet and let us pitch him our quirky prototype. I don't know how that happened. So this, ver this early version of the game that we showed, Shu and his crew at Sony back then, uh, was like rough and strange and hard to explain. But somehow, against all odds, Shu responded to it, or to us, I don't know. And he gave Harmonix our first shot as a game developer, um, which changed the trajectory of the company forever, of course. And that game that we eventually shipped for holiday of 2001 on the PS2 uh, was called Frequency. And so when we released this game, um, we were really excited and we were confident because, you know, you know our playtesters were totally addicted to the game and like, we were having a blast with it and Sony was this huge, mighty publisher and like we had television advertising. Like that was like, so, that was crazy for us at the time. And the reviews started coming in and, and they were glowing and we started like right off the bat, like winning, winning a bunch of awards and like we were just psyched, right? This was our big break we thought. Um, and then we got sales data. And um, I probably shouldn't cite the actual numbers, but to quote one of my more colorful uh, board members uh, at the time, the game sold mouse nuts. <laughs> so, this is sort of a low res image, so if you need, uh, if you need help, it's, it's right there. It's the <laughs> so despite the disappointing sales numbers, um, Sony God bless them, uh, stood by us. Um, and there were a ton of things about frequency that just obviously be begged for improvement. Like it was pretty ugly and the difficulty curve was like really uh, steep and brittle and uh, like a bunch of other problems that made the game like somewhat, it looked pretty forbidding for novices. So Sony gave us another shot and greenlit a sequel which was called Amplitude. And, uh, and so we, like, we spent the next year and a quarter, year and a half, like, making the game better in a bunch of different ways. Um, and we were really proud of our pro uh, progress, and we were convinced from our internal playtesting, again, somehow, uh, that we had made something amazing, and, like, we were loving it. And, uh, you know, when we were nearing the finish line, we got another heaping dose of education uh, when Sony Marketing, our product manager, uh, decided, you know, to do some focus testing with the title as they were or in alpha or something. Um, so Sony took Amplitude into a, a focus test with a few dozen kind of randomly selected PS2 gamers. And the way this worked is we first gave the uh, gamers a, uh, a sell sheet with a picture and a description of the game. And uh, we asked them whether it looked interesting to them. Did they want to play this? And from that data, we derived a pre-play interest score. Um, and then next, the, the, the testers played the game for like a half an hour or something, and afterwards we asked them a bunch more questions, um, finishing with, do you in, intend to buy this game? And when the data came back, it was kind of interesting. So Sony called me and they told me two kind of headlines from this data. Um, first, the pre-play interest score was the lowest of any score they had ever taken into test. <laughs> and then second, the post-play intent to purchase score was the highest of any game they had ever taken through a test. So like in my youthful naivete, like I immediately focused on the second half of this and I, and I was like thrilled, right? And like, so I'm like doing cartwheels in my office and, and then the, the, the product manager at Sony, he's like, no, um, he very politely like interrupted me and explained like, I'm sorry, you don't really get it. Like we can't market this game. Like people don't want it until they've played it. But mind you, this was like, rewind, this was back in 2003, right? The world was very, the game business was very, very different then. Console games were distributed only at retail, like with all the physical costs that that uh, entailed. And downloadable demos on consoles were not a thing yet. So there was no cheap way to let players try your game. And social media was not a thing yet. So there was no easy way to let your 
like uh, your passionate early fans to shout from the mountaintops about your game. So stuck within working, you know, stuck working within this framework of physical marketing and distribution on consoles at that time, like we were going nowhere fast. And so Amplitude shipped and it got even more glowing reviews and won even more awards and yada yada and then the game did not sell. Oh, I love you PowerPoint. Okay, so the team was, uh, of course, we were like devastated by this because we loved this game and uh, also, frankly, we were almost out of business again, which was like a state that we had been teetering in and out of basically for eight years uh, at that point. Um, but we tried to learn some lessons from this failure about uh, what it took to make a music game that was more marketable in a world of physical you know, retail marketing and distribution. Anyway, right at this moment, and we were licking our wounds from our latest uh, defeat, two life-saving opportunities uh, appeared. The first was that Konami, it was a huge Japanese publisher who had had tons of success with music games in Japan, they had played Frequency and Amplitude and they wanted an original music game for the US market and in particular, they wanted to know if we would make a singing game for them. Um, so now the, the desire to sing is basically universal. And Anyone who has had a night, not a night out drinking a little bit too much, maybe, with friends and singing karaoke knows what just like ridiculous, crazy, stupid fun it can be. And not just fun, I mean, singing connects people with music in this really powerful, primal way. And so the opportunity to make that activity the core of our next game was really exciting for us. And we jumped on it, and then six very intense months later, we shipped Karaoke Revolution. And Karaoke Revolution was really different from our prior two games. It was like much more casual, light, social party experience, like not nearly as deep or sophisticated or as addictive as uh, our earlier games had been, but much, much easier to explain to people. And, uh, and our playtesting, which involved a lot of, you know, booze and laughter and fun in the office while we were making it, seemed to support our convictions that we had made something special that would take the world by storm. But of course we were wrong, and Karaoke Revolution did not take the world by storm. Um, it was actually uh, a little bit more successful than our earlier games had been, you know, presumably due to the simple you know, comprehensibility and broad appeal of karaoke. And Konami, you know, to their great credit, stuck with it for several more years. Uh, and we released uh, multiple kind of title updates, uh, you know, sequels and content releases over the subsequent uh, few years. But they all, they all fared, you know, pretty much similarly. So meanwhile, in parallel with all of this stuff on, on karaoke revolution, right after Amplitude had shipped, uh, Sony had come back to us and basically said, look, look guys, we like your music games and all, but no one buys them. So um, uh, meanwhile, we've got this, um, this new peripheral for the PS2 called the iToy in Europe, and it's like selling like bonkers in Europe. And could you guys like dream up some kind of new way to use this camera? Um, but not a music game, please. Um, and we were actually really torn by this, right? As you can imagine, like on the one hand, we loved the people at Sony, we had a good relationship, we wanted to keep working with them, and we were actually really creatively excited by the new um, design and creative opportunities afforded by this unusual new input device. Um, on the other hand, music was our passion, right? That was our reason for being in the world. And the idea of taking a non-music project felt like a kind of uh, surrender to us, but we decided to give it a shot, and uh, so Harmonix's adventures in motion gaming began at that point. That game we bit, built was called iToy Anti-Grav, um, and it was, uh, it, was, it was basically an extreme sports game uh, on a hoverboard, um, and it's sort of like SSX, but in the, in the sky. And there was, there was nothing really new about the gameplay itself. Uh, what was new was the user interface. Like the player controlled the game not with thumbs on, and fingers on a, on a controller, but with the motion of his entire body in front of the camera. Now, of course, now in the age of Kinect, this control method, which is sometimes called avateering, um, is it's well-known territory, right? But back in 2003 on the iToy, it was, it was actually a new frontier. So the game was actually pretty fun, um, provided that you were playing in a room with sufficient lighting so that the tracking actually worked, which sometimes it didn't. A lot of people don't have sufficient lighting in their living rooms. That didn't help. But anyway, at its heart, uh, this was kind of a run-of-the-mill extreme sports game. Um, and the reviews reflected that. And the anti-grav, you know, its Metacritic scores were like 10 to 15 points lower than all of the music games we had made previously. 
And then something really disorienting happened, uh, which is we shipped anti-grab in holiday of 2004, and it actually sold about three times better than any of our prior games had sold before that. So you would think that we would be like thrilled with our sudden taste of sales success. I mean, relatively speaking, this was not a big seller, but relative to our prior outings, right? Um, but actually, it cast us into this like confusing pit of self-doubt. <laughs> like, our feeling was like, if this non-music game that was like, had pretty mediocre reviews was selling over three times better than like these music games we had made that had like stellar reviews and we were really proud of, like was our whole mission as a company, was it just like this big fool's errand, you know, like uh, that we had been pursuing now at this point for almost a decade. And so like ironically, our most commercially successful uh, title at that point brought us almost to the point of surrender, actually, as a company in pursuit of music games. Like, we had serious, difficult talks about just going in a different direction. But at that dark moment, uh, Providence intervened, and Harmonix was contacted by a fellow named Kai Huang, who was the CEO of a tiny company called Red Octane. And uh, here began the next big chapter in Harmonix's history. So, Red Octane at that time was not a game publisher. They were just a small manufacturer of gaming peripherals, specifically dance pads for, you know, DDR on the, on the consoles. But they had just made a decision to become a publisher, and they wanted to focus mainly on music games um, because they liked them and because of their experience with peripherals. Um, and their proposition to us was really simple. Like, if Red Octane makes a guitar, will you guys make a guitar game? Uh, you know, something like Guitar Freaks, a Japanese guitar game, um, but for a U.S. audience. And initially, we were actually somewhat conflicted about this assignment um, because there was this long list of reasons why we should not do this if we were thinking rationally about it. Um, so we, our, the analysis went something like this. So Red Octane, they were, uh, they were a tiny publisher. They had, like, no publishing track record or experience. Uh, they had very little money or other resources. Um, this, this would be a peripheral-based game, which means it was going to have a really high price point, and it was going to be in a huge box, which makes it really hard to get into retail distribution. And also, is rock even popular anymore? I mean, this was in 2004, and really, like, at that point, for, like, years and years and years, like, it was all, like, pop, hip-hop, R&B was, like, dominating the charts. Like, there were not big rock bands, for the most part, at that time. So, like, every kind of calm, clear-headed, rational analysis of the situation said, there's no way this game is going to be successful. It's, it's, like, doomed to failure, and, like, we should not take this project. But then, on the, you know, on the positive side of the ledger, like, we really wanted to make a fucking guitar <laughs> game. Right? So, and so it was decided. And uh, we were off to the races. And uh, we had just eight months and a very small budget, and we got to work on uh, the game that came to be known eventually as Guitar Hero. So we, um, you know, we spent the rest of that year uh, just pouring our hearts and souls into that game, and we finished it. And you know, when we finished it in the fall of 2005, we were really proud of it. We were like having a blast playing with it and you know and of course like always before we had this like faint flicker of hope you know maybe this time maybe this time right but we had been here before and by this point we had been like so battered by so many years of dashed expectations and commercial failure I, I remember joking with our team internally just before we released the game like well guys we're about to make 75,000 people really happy <laughs> so um, and in fact, uh, when Red Octane first released the game, they had almost no marketing budget, and they didn't have enough money to make very much inventory. So our sales numbers for, the, for Guitar Hero 1 um, were actually also quite modest. Um, but then, slowly, reorders started trickling in. And as weeks and months passed, uh, those reorders kept getting bigger and bigger. And suddenly, everything started to change. And as Guitar Hero started to snowball, uh, it started attracting attention of the big guys, right? So Activision swooped in quickly and purchased Red Octane and the Guitar Hero property uh, along with it. Uh, and soon thereafter, uh, Harmonix was purchased by 
Viacom and uh, became a part of MTV Games. So we, uh, we finished Guitar Hero 2 for Holiday in 2006. And by this time, the market, like it had been building for a year, and at this point, the market was actually aware and ready and waiting for it. And, you know, Activision is a mighty publisher, and they have plenty of money to manufacture lots of plastic guitars. And uh, the thing just finally exploded in Holiday of 2006. And at long last, you know, we had our first hit. So, and, At this point, um, we were dealing with a very different size of nuts altogether. <laughs> so we went home for the holidays, and actually for the very first time in our whole history, when we would talk to our relatives about what game we were making, like people actually had heard of it. And this was like a really di different feeling for us. Like I, our, I, our family and friends started taking us slightly more seriously at this point. But really, it was like, it felt really good because after 10 years, it felt like this mission that we had been working on towards for so long was finally starting to come to pass. But you would think that after 10 years, like on the brink of death and barely staying uh, afloat, that we would have been, you'd think we'd have been like just running around high-fiving each other at this point. Um, but that moment never actually quite materialized because uh, by the time Guitar Hero 2 shipped, we were already too busy like freaking out about the next game we wanted to make, which was uh, Rock Band. So, the, um, the reason that we were so uh, eager uh, to make this game immediately was, well, we, we desperately wanted to give people the experience of playing music together as a band. Uh, which is this whole dimension of music making that like our, our earlier games hadn't hadn't captured and it's this crucial other dimension of what music is is all about but making rock band was also completely terrifying for us for about five different reasons okay so first of all now we're part of mtv um and like uh, rock band is not going to be published uh by activision it's going to be published by our new uh, our new owner, MTV Games, which means we are going to be in direct competition with Activision, and Activision is very, very good at what they do. And from just a purely business standpoint, we were kind of dreading the fact that we were now going to be in direct competition with, uh, with these guys. And second, just from an emotional standpoint, like we had completely poured ourselves into, you know, Guitar Hero was our baby, and then suddenly we were going to be competing with it, which was just like emotionally really complex for us. Um, third, uh, we suddenly had to learn how to make hardware. And uh, not just fake guitars, but also fake drum sets and drumsticks and microphones and USB hubs uh, on a crazy tight schedule, and not just a few of them, but millions and millions of them in China, which it turns out is really, really hard to do, especially if you've never done it before. Um, so, like, also, especially if you're making hardware that you expect your players to beat on with sticks while drunk. Um, so. <laughs> We all aged like 10 years in that one year that we spent like learning how to make rock band hardware. Um, fourth, the studio was growing like mad at this point. We were like ballooning, you know, just to keep up with all this madness, we were growing from like 70-ish people to like close to 300 at the peak, which add, that growth just added a lot of chaos and strain to the organization. And fifth, we were terrified because we were making a game that had so much plastic in the box that we had to charge almost $200 for a video game just to like barely cover our costs and make a wafer thin profit like on each uh, unit of uh, that bundle that we sold. And like we really thought we might be insane to expect that people would be willing to spend almost $200 for a video game. So thankfully it turns out that under the right circumstances people will spend almost $200 for a video game. <laughs> Um, and at this point, uh, Rock Band and, and Guitar Hero both had just became something of a cultural phenomenon. And, you know, the day, well, first Guitar Hero and then eventually uh, Rock Band appeared in an episode of South Park, I momentarily felt that I could die a happy man. It was, it was a personal highlight of my life that night. Um, so, again, you'd think at this point the team at Harmonix would have just been like running victory laps. Um, but of course, life doesn't actually quite work that way. Like in real life, unlike in games, like you never actually beat the game, right? You, the best you can hope for really is occasionally to beat the level, so to speak, but then there's always like another level waiting for you there. 
Um, and as I mentioned, Activision, those guys are very good at what, we, what they do, and it was like immediately apparent that we were going to be in for the fight of our lives um, in the battle of the band games. So um, 2008 was the beginning of uh, a strangely discordant few years for us, um, which I'll try to explain. So on the one hand, uh, looking at this peri period just from a purely creative standpoint, like it was an amazing time. Like we made Rock Band 2, um, and then later Rock Band 3, and like each of those iterations improved the games in a bunch of ways, and reviewers seemed to be lapping it up, and our hardcore fans seemed to be loving it, and we were loving it, and oh, and in between, uh, we actually got to work with the Beatles, which uh, like, <laughs> no, like, holy crap, let me just dwell on this for a minute, because it was like, it was a dream project for a bunch of us, uh, and like with so many surreal moments uh, along the way, so I'll just share a few quick anecdotes. So, Early on, I remember actually demoing an early prototype to Paul McCartney and, you know, playing his own bass lines back to him on my fake plastic guitar. <laughs> and now, I normally don't really get nervous around famous people, but, like, the Beatles were, like, childhood heroes of mine. Um, and so I was really, really nervous for that uh, demo. And Paul could sense that. And uh, after the demo, he he reached into his bag and he pulled out, of all things, a bunch of uh, fresh cut lavender sprigs and handed the bunch to me. And he told me that he had cut them from his garden that morning and that he likes to keep some handy uh, because the scent of it helps him relax when, he's, when things are stressing him out. And it was this really like warm, unexpected, disarming gesture that like, totally set the tone for the rest of that project. Um, and there was a time when uh, George Harrison's just lovely wife, Olivia Harrison, invited a bunch of the members of the team uh, into her home to like break out old family photo albums, uh, you know, photos of George and share memories with us. Um, there was an evening, a long, long e evenings that I got to spend with uh, uh, George's son, uh, Danny Harrison, amazing young man, um, playing music and then just uh, brainstorming about visual ideas for the dreamscapes that we were going to put into the game. Uh, much later in the project, uh, there was a moment where uh, Yoko Ono was actually here in Cambridge visiting Harmonix, uh, reviewing the game, and in particular, how were we doing with it, the treatment of John Lennon in the game. And there was this tense moment where she was really focused on his eyes and, and being, like, making it really clear to us that the way we were dealing with eye animation in the game was not capturing John's spirit. And that this was, uh, you know, this was a terrifying moment for us, because she, she was right, of course. And then a few days later, after we were, like, intensively focusing on this, you know, we got the message back from her that, like, okay, yeah, you guys, you finally got it. And then there was this, like, incredible relief and elation that happens when you're, like, working so hard on something that you, that you care so much about. And so, like, you can imagine for, for me, as, like, a Beatles super fan as a kid growing up, like, how rewarding it was to work on a project like this from a creative standpoint. And really, the same goes for Rock Band uh, 2 and Rock Band 3. Like, the team was killing themselves making those titles and having a blast doing it. And, like, so that was the creative experience of this period, right? Meanwhile, uh, looking at this period pur purely through a business lens, like, the sky was falling. Right? Over these few years, the band game genre contracted nearly as quickly as it had appeared. And so this is sort of like what our, this is what things look like from a business standpoint over the next few years. So like each, each year, like the, our next title sold less and less. And to make matters much worse, both we and our competitors, Activision, I think had underestimated the pace of contraction uh, in, in this market. And we had made and sold way too much inventory and sold it into retail. So we all had to like market way down uh, below cost to sell it through retail, like a lot of it. And uh, we eventually, you know, as a studio at Harmonix, we eventually had to do multiple rounds of layoffs while th this was happening, which on a human level are just awful, they're just brutal. Um, and it was kind of a sustained horror show during this period for, uh, for us as a business. Um, so, which was just a, a, a very strange dissonance between uh, the, con the stark contrast between the creative experience we were having and, and the business experience we were having, which is often something that creative businesses have to grapple with. And so, uh, over this period, uh, most, of our, most of our rock band players gradually moved on. Um, interestingly, though, uh, 
many of them have just kept on playing. And like to this day, years and years after our last release, a few hundred thousand of them just like keep playing, like week after week, month after month, and they just keep showing up playing the game. And God, I love these guys. And uh, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to some of the longtime regulars on the rock band forums who just, uh, who are just still right there with us. Like, thank, thank you guys. Um, so, anyway, by the time we had released Rock Band 3, uh, Viacom had understandably just about uh, had had their fill of video game publishing and hardware manufacturing. Um, and at the end of 2010, uh, with the help of some private equity investors, we spun the company back out of Viacom. Uh, and took it private again. And after four years at Viacom, we were suddenly independent again. So, this was, uh, on the one hand, it was like, it was, it, it was exciting, it was a new beginning for us, right? But on the other hand, like, our pillar franchise was in tatters. And uh, as you can imagine, this was like an intimidating period for us because we, we weren't sure what would happen next. But um, at some point during like the rock band contraction phase, like it became apparent to us that we needed to start working on something uh, totally different. Um, and in thinking about our prior experience uh, with the uh, with the iToy, we became really motivated to create. You know, of course, we had seen what had happened over the years with Dance Dance Revolution, but we became really motivated to create uh, a new kind of dance game, like not not one with just you know stepping on a pad on the floor, but like one with real full body choreography. Um, and so why do this? Um, well, because dance is another universal way that people connect with music, physically, on a profound, primal level. And we wanted to uh, explore the power of that connection through gameplay. And that game uh, became Dance Central. So, we, we had a blast making this game, really, in part because we suddenly had a bunch of professional choreographers in the building on our design team, team which gave us this like, totally different like, window into the world. And uh, there was a lot of dancing in the office every day, which is not something most people get to say about their offices. And uh, also, our QA department got in really good shape that year. <laughs> So, um, with Microsoft, we released this game um, uh, alongside the Kinect at Holiday 2010. And, like, at, at first we really had no idea how this title was going to do, or the Kinect was going to do, um, for that matter. And, we, and with us just on our way out of Viacom and on our own again, really the fate of the studio depended to a very large degree on whether the market actually wanted a dancing game. Um, you know, it had been a few years since our last near-death experience, since before Viacom, but like here we were again, yet again, potentially. Um, but thankfully, people really like to dance. Uh, so Dance Central sold uh, really well, um, and we could all just exhale for a moment, and Harmonix would uh, live to fight another day. So we, we went on to make a couple of sequels, and we were, uh, we were really enjoying it and having a blast making uh, those titles. But we were also nearing the tail of the seventh gen uh, you know, console cycle. So very shortly after releasing Dance Central, uh, we began thinking deep thoughts about you know, what is our next big idea for the future of music games? What's next? So, uh, as I said, you know, we were having a lot of fun with motion control at that time, of course, coming off of the, you know, our success with Dance Central, and Connect was all the hotness uh, at that time. So we were doing a bunch of prototyping and experiments with like, how we could fuse motion control with interactive music and gameplay in new ways. And it was at that moment, which was actually winter of uh, 2011, early 2011, that we serendipitously got a call from Disney. And um, honestly, we were like a little bit sort of skeptical and maybe snooty or standoffish uh, at first uh, until they said one word uh, which suddenly got our attention. And that word was Hannah Montana. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry, that's two words. What I meant to say was uh, that word was Fantasia. Not that Fantasia, <laughs> this Fantasia. So.
Um, so Fantasia had been a really inspiring film for many of us at Harmonix, you know, maybe because most of us had gotten high watching it in college. Um, <laughs> but as we all, as we, at that point, uh, after Disney approached us, you know, we all started watching uh, the film again. And uh, in particular, we were really inspired by this, the, the iconic tableau of Mickey as the Sorcerer's Apprentice in his dream sequence on the, on the cliff, commanding the heavens and the sea and the weather all in sync with the music. And it was this image of, you know, music and magic and motion all working together in unison that was our creative jumping off point for a new kind of music game. So um, in this game, like if you haven't seen anything about it yet, uh, the player plays the role of sorcerers, of a sorcerer's apprentice uh, in the land of Fantasia where um, music and magic are one and the same, the same force. And the most basic, uh, the core gameplay in the game, we think of as a kind of like rhythmic gestural spell casting done in sync with the music. And it, it sort of feels like dance uh, with the upper body, but it's actually quite a bit less strict than Dance Central. Um, and it gives the player a lot more freedom for personal interpretation uh, uh, of the gestures. And anyway, this, this gameplay core, it's, it's really fun. Uh, we're having a great time with this game. Um, but what I actually want to talk about today is not that. Um, what I want to talk about is a bunch of the stuff that we're, we're trying to do in the game beyond that, that core. Um, so first of all, in some sense, Fantasia uh, is a return to our very earliest roots, specifically our interest in enabling players to express themselves musically, to be creative with music. And we're going after this in many, many different ways in Fantasia. Um, the first way is through remixing. Uh, so the game will feature uh, quite a lot of licensed music and a wide variety of genres. Um, and for each licensed song, you know, we have the multi-tracks broken apart by uh, the, all the different instruments, but we've also produced a number of additional kind of stylistic renditions of that song in wildly different musical styles. And at key moments in the performance gameplay, uh, the player is able to grab like a, one layer, musical layer, one strand from another one of these kind of stylistic interpretations and weave it into the core mix. And they're able to do that at multiple points in the game. So it creates this uh, a great opportunity for experimentation with crafting really different versions of the song uh, guided by the player's uh, tastes and experimentation and instincts. So that's, that's one layer of creativity. Um, another is this set of live performance tools um, that we call uh, manipulators. And there are a bunch of different kinds of these, um, each of which enables the player to freely and gesturally improvise some music in real time and save it as a recorded loop in real time uh, and then composite it back into the, the, the background music that's playing. Um, so that's a, a sort of like real-time compositional element that we've woven into the gameplay as well. So there are a bunch of other creative elements uh, in the game as well as other forms of music gameplay, some of which are less performative and more like uh, exploratory than the, the performance gameplay I talked about. Um, but I won't talk about them all today. Um, I do want to touch briefly on one other aspect of the game, which we haven't really talked about, um, which is just how freaking trippy it is. Um, like, the, the original film uh, took players on a pretty strange trip at times, and as a nod to that heritage, uh, we also wanted this game to take players to some far out places. So to illustrate that point a bit, uh, here is a short collection of footage from Fantasia Music Evolved.
Okay, so um, uh, that's it for today uh, on F Fantasia. Uh, Disney will be shipping this game for fall of this year on Xbox uh, One and Xbox 360. And we've been working uh, on this game for quite some time. We love it. We're really proud of it. And uh, we're, we're really eager to get it out into the world, into players' hands. Um, okay, so before I move on to some of the other stuff we're working on right now, uh, I want to spend a couple of minutes just doing some armchair philosophizing uh, as a context as kind of for some of the significant changes that Harmonix is undergoing as a studio and how we think about making games. So uh, I was at the Dice Summit in Las Vegas uh, a couple of months ago, and Andrew Shepard, who is the head of studios at Kabam, uh, gave a talk in which, uh, among other things, he mentioned a couple of the core values at Kabam, um, which were conviction and humility. And this pr particular juxtaposition really uh, resonated with me, uh, as it's a pair of competing forces or ideals that we grapple with quite a lot at Harmonix, actually. Um, so as a game maker, you absolutely need fierce creative conviction. You can't survive without of it, a lot of it. You, know, you need passion and confidence that the thing that you're playing in your mind is going to blow people away. You need that confidence to uh, inspire and align a team uh, around you. You need it to excite publishers who you might depend upon for, uh, for funding. Um, you need it to excite journalists. You need it to uh, convince consumers to give your game a try or to back your Kickstarter. Like, you need this. And actually, generally speaking, you know, the odds are so stacked against you most, most of the time as a game developer that you need a certain amount of like fierce conviction just to persevere. Um, but here's the thing. Like, even really smart, really talented, passionate people with heaps of vision and heaps of conviction are sometimes just wrong. Uh, actually, they're wrong a lot of the time. And uh, in my experience, you know, the people who manage to succeed repeatedly and sustainably over the long arcs of their lives and careers are the one who, alongside their conviction, are able to maintain a heaping dose of humility, you know, as a, just a recognition that the world is a very, very complicated place. And none of us is nearly as smart or wise or prescient as we would like to be. Um, so on this subject, one of my, one of my favorite uh, pithy Mark Twain quips uh, is this gem, which maybe you've heard. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. So while I'm on this subject, uh, I want to talk about another philosopher, uh, a fellow named Heraclitus, um, who was one of the early Greek philosophers, pre-Socratic. And uh, Heraclitus was apparently so, you know, bummed out about the world in general all of the time that he earned himself the excellent emo nickname, the Weeping Philosopher. Um, <laughs> but let's not hold that against the poor chap. Um, all right, so one of Heraclitus' remarks that has proven the most enduring and I think about a lot is this one. No man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river, and he's not the same man. So these are profound words that you can think about in many dimensions of your life, but like, what does it have to do with game development? So as a game developer, uh, particularly one who's been fortunate enough to have experienced some success, it is a very, very easy trap to fall into, uh, to let yourself believe that your prior success has proven that you possess some secret wisdom about the world that you will then use to make uh, your next game and that it will be successful as well. Um, it's easy, in other words, to think that you are uh, the same man entering that river again. Uh, but in fact, the river, by which I mean the marketplace of people that you're trying to entertain and inspire, is constantly churning and changing, evolving. And you, know, you the game developer, the man stepping, as it were, um, the people in your studio are changing as well. I mean, even if it's literally the same group of people, those people have grown. Uh, and changed and evolved in subtle ways. And they've developed new priorities, maybe, or new, new, new proficiencies, probably, but also maybe new biases or new blind spots. For it's not the same river, and he's not the same man.
this is a this is a kind of mantra of humility for me, and I think any game developer, you know, particularly successful ones who think they've got it all figured out, would be well advised to remain mindful of. Um, so that's all well and good, but how does this actually apply to the practice of making games? Well, let's say you start, as most game developers do, with this burning conviction about this game you're dying to make because it's going to be so amazing because of X, Y, and Z. Um, and you need to start there. Um, but if you're also mindful that many of your assumptions about the world are quite possibly dead wrong, uh, then good game development becomes very much about finding the shortest path to learning all of the things that you're wrong about. Uh, and in practice, this means that you can make, say, the first, let's call it 10 or 15 percent of your game just enough to capture the bare essence of what you think is so special and important about it. And then promptly have the humility, and the courage for that matter, to start finding out whether there's an audience that actually agrees with you that that thing is special and important. And you do this by putting it in real players' hands. And I don't mean internal play tests, I mean real players out in the world in a live environment in volume. And if people do want what you've started making, then that's fantastic. And you can make the rest of it as envisioned. And as an added bonus, you get to make the rest of the game with your players right there with you as active contributors and collaborators to the process of making that game. Um, but if it turns out that you're wildly mistaken, and people are often wildly mistaken, then man, you've just dodged a bullet. Uh, either because you can, you know, significantly course correct early on, uh, or worst case, you can, like, shed some tears, kill the thing in the crib, and, like, move on to your next brilliant idea, which I'm sure you have, right? So this is, uh, what I'm saying here is this is not a, a, a new concept, <laughs> obviously. This is an approach to making games that has been at the heart of a massive transformation in the game industry over the past decade or so, particularly on mobile platforms and, and PC, with consoles being very much the laggard in this regard. Uh, and Harmonix, as a historically a console-focused game developer, um, we've, we have operated to date very much under the model of like building a whole game, shipping it, and praying to God that we made the right game. Um, but we are now, finally, uh, in the process of adapting ourselves to this new world. Um, and uh, trying to learn how to invite our audience into the process of making games much, much earlier. Which is uh, just some context that I wanted to provide uh, before moving on to you know, some of the other stuff that we're working on. So the next project I want to talk about a bit is Chroma. So... We, uh, we announced this project about a month ago, um, and for those of you uh, who haven't seen it, um, here's a short uh, like teaser uh, trailer that we are, uh, released with the announce. This isn't gameplay footage, it's kind of a concept piece. What the hell is this thing? Um, so in short, it's a music-driven shooter, uh, specifically an online arena shooter, but with music woven into the core of the play experience. Um, and the initial inspiration uh, for this idea, you won't be surprised to hear, came more than a dozen of years ago from Res. 
um, which was the first game that I know of that kind of scratched at the surface of this idea of fusing music with shooters, uh, in that case, a rail shooter. Um, but I, there was clearly a lot more lurking beneath the surface. And more than a decade later, we wanted to revisit the concept and see where we could take it. So at a high level, Chroma uh, is a team-based, class-based, player versus player, first-person shooter. At least that's what it is in its current incarnation. Um, it's intended to be free to play on Steam. And in all of these high-level respects, its nearest cousin would be something like Team Fortress 2. Um, but what makes it special uh, is how we're trying to integrate music into the play experience. So we're experimenting uh, along a bunch of different conceptual axes in this game. So I'll just run through them quickly. So the first, obviously, musical shooting. So in Chroma, uh, shooting your weapon produces musical sound, and that music is visualized uh, for you in light and color. And in addition to kind of familiar weapon types and weapon mechanics, we're also playing with many additional weapon types that integrate rhythm in some way into the, the shooting mechanics. So for example, uh, rhythm action firing, where you're actually like playing rhythmic patterns, like a kick and snare, or drum patterns, uh, you know, to fire your weapon, so that shooting your weapon is like a kind of music performance. Uh, there's another weapon that's a grenade launcher, where you fi can fire it at any time, but the grenades only detonate on the, the downbeat, meaning the first beat of the next measure, so using that weapon well becomes all about rhythmic anticipation. Um, there's a sniper rifle that's a one-shot kill, but only if you shoot it on the downbeat. Uh, so you have to really be in the zone uh, to use that weapon effectively. So th these sorts of things, like a half dozen, dozen other types. Um, so music traversal, getting around the map. Like we're trying to make this musical as well. Uh, as you're running, you can dash on the downbeat to propel yourself forward. Uh, you can jump anytime you want, but if you jump on the downbeat, you jump twice as high. Um, there's also this kind of high-speed transit network you can use to zip around the map really uh, efficiently, and you need rhythm action in order to use that as well. Uh, another concept we're playing with, musical environments or musical maps. Um, we actually, uh, we're playing with transforming the maps, the shape and layout of the maps, in synchrony with significant changes in the musical form, like from verse to chorus to bridge or whatever. Um, that way, players who are listening to the music and anticipate these structural changes can position themselves at the right place and time in the map to take tactical advantage. Um, musical teamwork. So uh, Chroma is currently class-based, meaning there are different player types with different abilities. Um, but the, the musical parallel that we've uh, adopted is that your team is your band. So each class type is associated with a particular instrument type. So for example, one class contributes uh, percussion elements to the mix and another bass to the mix, etc. And then, you know, then if your whole team is acting in concert, there's the tactical benefits of that, of course, but there's also, your, it's the entire musical ensemble acting together. And finally, uh, musical identity. So before battle, in the, at the loadout stage, you can actually uh, customize the musical content of the weapons that you're using. So each player can choose specific drum patterns or bass uh, lines or melodic riffs, independent of the background so song that you're, you're selecting. Um, as, as a kind of signature ingredient of that player in the musical mix. And we eventually would hope to have like thousands uh, of these. And so the act of uh, customizing your weapon with your own music becomes like a meaningful axis of personalization. So look, tons of different ideas in play here. Um, but the key point, hearkening back to my prior philosophizing, um, in terms of how Harmonix is evolving its approach to making games is that Chroma is not a finished product yet, like not even close. Um, it's, I, I think of it as a package of experiments around an idea. And um, we've already uh, delivered this to a live audience in a, in a, a small uh, kind of closed early alpha in Steam to begin the process of learning, um, begin a dialogue with that audience and start figuring out what's really working here, what's not working, where should we evolve this concept in the future in collaboration with those fans. Um, before I move on from this, uh, let me just show you a very brief clip, uh, like 20 or 30 seconds, of a few moments of combat in the game as it stands at this kind of early rough stage, um, just to give you a sense of where it's at at the moment. <laughs> Oh, 
So as you can see, pretty crazy. Um, and um, it's a very long way to go, but it's, it, but it's already uh, like really fun in a kind of intense and unusual way. <laughs> Um, so that's that. Um, now I want to move on to something completely different from that, um, which is that uh, in addition to our current and future projects on the consoles, and now you know Chroma being our first project on the PC, uh, Harmonix has also started developing music games for mobile platforms as well. So we have dabbled uh, with this just a little bit in the past, but we've finally gotten serious about it. Uh, and frankly, we're, we're, we're pretty psyched about the creative challenges uh, of dreaming up new sorts of music play experiences on, you know, phones and tablets. It's a really interesting area to play with. And um, in parallel with the mobile initiative, we also have a core technology team at Harmonix that um, has a number of different initiatives underway. But one of them is some audio tech that we've been developing over the past year or two that um, basically enables players to import uh, songs from their own personal music collections into the music games that we're making. Um, and this audio tech analyzes the song that you give it and extracts from it a bunch of high-level musical information um, that is needed to then generate custom gameplay for that song. So players can essentially personalize the music game um, to work with their own favorite music. So, of course, uh, we are not the first people by a long shot to explore this idea, right? Um, the first game that I know of that uh, did this uh, was Vibribbon um, in Japan back on the original PlayStation in uh, around 2000, I think. Uh, and since then, there have been tons of other game games that have uh, kind of riffed on this idea of uh, Audio Surf, Beat Hazard, a bunch of others. Um, but we, we think it can be done better than it's been done so far and we want to try. And the reason we want to try is, you know, unsurprisingly, in music games, like, if you really love the music in the game, you enjoy the game more. Um, and so the, the opportunity of this idea is that it allows us, uh, you know, to create a game that is, like, maximally entertaining for a large, diverse audience who have very fragmented musical tastes. So anyway, um, our, our very, uh, the very first of our experiments uh, in this area is like a, a very simple free-to-play game um, called Record Run, which we will be uh, finishing up a first version of and releasing very soon, like over the coming weeks sometime. Um, now Record Run, as I'll bet you can guess from the name, is a runner, like countless other games in the App Store. Um, but what makes it a music game is that uh, all of the character action, all of the jumps and ducks and dodges and et cetera, um, they're all rhythmically aligned with the, the pulse and content of the soundtrack. So it feels really rhythmic and musical to play. Um, a few other games like uh, Bit Trip Runner um, have explored the rhythm runner idea. Um, but in the case of Record Run, you know, we're using this audio tech that I talked about. So the game's soundtrack is the songs that you love the most from your personal you know, music collection. And here's just a super short clip of, uh, of gameplay work in progress. So this is one idea, a, you know, pretty straightforward one to start with. Um, we also have a gameplay R&D uh, group uh, at Harmonix, a really talented team, I love these guys, um, who are doing tons of experimentation and rapid iteration on uh, like a wide variety of far out gameplay concepts. At the moment, you know, thinking about mobile. Um, and just for fun, uh, we pulled together a short clip that simultaneously shows you 13 different mobile music game concepts that they prototyped in the last two months. Um, so here's that. So, right, so there's some really crazy shit in there, like I, 
I don't know where these guys come up with some of the stuff that they come up with. Actually, I have my theories, but I, let's not dwell on that. <laughs> Um, so, lots of other irons in the fire uh, on mobile. Um, most of them very, very different from this first one, record one that's coming soon. So you'll see, you know, uh, you'll hear more from us about this over the, over the coming year. Um, so, we also have uh, a few other really interesting projects brewing at Harmonix right now, um, but unfortunately we're not quite uh, able to talk about them today. Um, we will have more to say over the coming months. Um, and I also think that I've been going on for quite long enough uh, up here this morning, so I'll try to bring it to a close. Um, I hope I haven't wasted your time this morning. Um, there are just two last points that I want to make before we break. Um, first, uh, Harmonix has been making games for a long while now, and uh, in that time, as a studio, uh, we've been through some, you know, as you've seen, some like really crazy high highs and like some really difficult lows. Um, and over the course of all these crazy ups and downs, uh, a lot of like really casual gamers and non-gamers have uh, kind of come and gone and come and gone uh, in waves over the years. And they've showed up in passing at times to enjoy Harmonix's games, um, which, you know, which has been an incredible blessing for us. Um, but through all of these tumultuous rough periods, there has always been this like dedicated core of passionate, thoughtful, devoted, serious gamers that has stuck with us through thick and thin. And you know, honestly, that devotion uh, or commitment to us as we've sort of worked our way through this, um, it was a huge part of what has enabled us to actually persevere through all these years. And. Uh, it's also that tribe of passionate, dedicated gamers that converges on PAX every year, uh, which is what makes this event so special and so different from like all of the other game industry events that happen during the year. And it's also what makes it such um, a privilege for me to have a chance to just stand here and share a few stories with you guys this morning. Um, and finally, you know, I just, <laughs> I want to say that even though I've stood here this morning and told you like a bunch of like stories and trials and tribulations that Harmonix has been through over the years, um, I want to like hasten to add to that that there are really very few uh, blessings in life that are quite so great uh, as being able to spend one's days laboring intensely in the service of something that one truly loves. And uh, that's just the blessing that's been afforded to many of us at Harmonix uh, for so many years now. Um, and just looking ahead, uh, I just want to say that we're going to continue striving uh, to find new ways to connect people to music more deeply and, and connect them to each other through games. And we will keep striving to find new ways to amplify this incredible power that music somehow has over human hearts and souls and imaginations. Uh, thank you all for your time. Let's go have some fun.
Thank you.